OK, I think we're recording now. So good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you joining us this morning for this session. And um, thank you very much to all of you for for coming along. I know you're very busy with your revision, but thank you for taking the time to be here because we really appreciate that. For those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Sarah Anthinar. I'm the Modern Foreign Languages Coordinator here at City and Islington College. And today we're very, very lucky, extremely lucky to have Dr. Cosley with us and also Ashley Poole from Essex University. And they will do a quiz for us on linguistics that we're very excited about. So please, can you use the chat because I'm not sure you're, una you're able or not able to unmute yourself. We can try, but I'm not sure. If you can talk, can you please put your questions or your comments in the chat? And maybe you can have five minutes at the end, if that's OK, to do the Q&A. Or maybe, you know, if, if you're happy both for them to ask questions, well, maybe I can filter them, them as well. We can we can keep an eye on the chat. I hope you're really excited for the quiz as I am to learn about linguistics and Dr. Cosley and, and Ashley. Thank you very much again for being here today and over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sarah. And thanks for joining everybody there. Nine o'clock for a quiz is uh, some commitment. So thank you for that. Um, so my name is Tracy Cosley and I work in the Department of Language and Linguistics at Essex. And one of the things that we are really conscious of is that really many people don't really know what linguistics is. Um, you know, that we don't really study it at A level or at, at colleges. So it's really hard to know kind of well, what, what do people actually do and, and what do, do linguists do or, or people like myself. Um, so what we decided in the department was that maybe it would be helpful to put some questions together about the kinds of things that we're sort of uh, kind of geekly, enthusiastically interested in and the kinds of things that you might end up um, studying if you came to do linguistics at somewhere like Essex, but also more broadly, like the kinds of things that um, happen within within linguistics. Um, so do feel free to ask questions or shout out or whatever, you know, if anything isn't clear, um, you can always go back to things. So this is really just designed to be sort of fun, really. So if you uh, if you want to, um, you can kind of uh, write down your answers and I'll kind of give you the answers at the end. So I'll go through, we've got 10 questions um, and then I'll go through the answers at the end, but also to try and give you a little bit more um, information as we go along. Um, so the first question then, very excitingly, is this idea of, uh, so question one, in Finnish, I apologise, I'm not a speaker of, of Finnish, so often kind of uh, stereotypes of linguists is that we know hundreds of languages and we're able to do uh, all kinds of different things in different languages, and, and for some people that's true, and for some people you know, that isn't necessarily true, but we have an interest in language, that's, that's for sure. So in that spirit then, in Finnish, um, the word Kalsikarikanit, uh, um, e.g. I'm going to do this at home today, means what? Do you think it means A, painting and decorating, sort of general DIY? Does it mean B, drinking by yourself at your house in your underwear with no intention of going out? Or does it mean C, cooking over an open fire and eating and drinking outside with your friends? Um, so one of the reasons we might ask this type of question or not be interested in this kind of thing is that you know, how do different languages kind of make meaning so you know these words there's particularly words like in um, particularly languages like Finnish but certainly others where you know the prefixes and suffixes so how you build the word is really interesting in terms of you know the similarities or differences to English but also what you can do um, in, in different languages that you can't do in English for example um, so what do we think this word might mean um, these, three, these three choices um, we don't necessarily teach or study Finnish um, at the university, um, but these, we might be using Finnish um, for example, as examples of kind of different types of grammar, different types of syntax, as I said, different types of language rules. And we have lots of colleagues in the department who work on um, a range of African languages, particularly Bantu languages. Um, so again, they might be doing similar things with, um, with those languages, but also then English, French, German, Spanish, etc. So again, kind of looking at um, the ways different languages move, change, behave over time, etc. are some of the things that we uh, might be looking at. So then, uh, question two, uh, all of the following words mean the same thing, but come from different parts of the UK. Um, so this, these words, um, cob, balm, batch, tea cake and muffin, they all have the same meaning. And so what is it? Is it A, B, C or D? So is it a biscuit? Ah, B, this is a tricky one, isn't it? Is it scone, scone? I, in uh, terms of pronunciation, I don't really know anymore, but I was speaking to my nan at the weekend who was from, well, myself also from Suffolk, 
Um, so she has a really strong Suffolk accent. So she says schoon. Um, so take your pick. <laughs> Is it scone, scone, schoon, uh, a bread roll or an apple? Uh, so there's this idea again of you know, how do um, how do words develop? How does meaning change? Um, how do accents influence how we say things, what we do with language? And how how and where people say certain things using what kinds of what kinds of voice? Does anyone have a, a question about that? I can't, I don't know. Okay. So yeah, biscuits, scones, going bread roll or apple. I don't know what you know with that scones going thing. Now that's my sort of default out of nervous sort of. I don't really know anymore in terms of pronunciations, but I know that there are uh, kind of you know a world of. Uh, discussions that happen around that so maybe think about yourself what do you say how do you pronounce it what does it mean does it mean anything really um yes. question number three um oh, sorry i should just say you know in terms of kind of disciplines the types of areas that might look at these kinds of things would be kind of considered to be sociolinguistics so again sort of things that you might be familiar with if you've been kind of working um on different languages or things to do with uh, um language and gender um, language and ethnicity. So all of those things might be kind of looked at under the ideas of um, social linguistics. And um, question number three, how many sign languages are there in the world um, or are used in the world? Is it one, seven, 30 and, and 200? So in the same way that we do different things with spoken languages, the sign languages also make use of you know, a, a range of different uh, grammatical rules and grammatical structures um, and sort of, you know, again, a study of those languages as well might be something that you take part in as a linguist. Um, we have colleagues um, in the department who do work um, you know, on sign languages and particularly around trying to understand um, deaf communication and deaf communication patterns across different languages. So you know questions for me as somebody who's perhaps more interested in maybe multilingualism is how do you you know how do people move in and out of different languages? So if people are signing in one language do they then shift and sign in another language? How does that work? Um, other colleagues might be more interested in what happens inside, so internally from a more psycholinguistic perspective. So is there a difference in your brain patterns when you're signing to when you're doing all sort of audio um, languages as well? So again, a whole range of different questions that people might be um, interested in. And also, again, coming back to things kind of more perhaps more traditional descriptive um, linguistics. Now, how do they, how, do, how does the language actually do it? What's the structure? What's the grammar? How, how, how is meaning made? And so again, we can kind of look at all of these topics in a way from a whole bunch of different um, sort of linguistic perspectives. Bunch is a, a nice formal word there. Um, a question number four, uh, about 30% of the words in the English language were originally borrowed from a particular language. So which one is it? Is it French, German, Icelandic or Swahili? So we know that languages borrow all languages kind of in a way sort of borrow change morph over time um, and English is, is one of those and it does borrow sort of widely from a range of different languages so it might be that you think well, actually it borrows from you know quite a few of these um, that's you know that's fine which one is it that kind of you would suggest would be about sort of 30 percent um, and again sort of the one of the things that we might look at might be sort of historically, so perhaps socio-culturally, so sort of how, you know, when are there periods in history that particular um, areas or particular regions, particular languages were borrowed from, what was happening at those times, um, what, what might have been influencing the language. Um, so again, kind of, you know, that linguistics isn't just always looking at the language, but the language in context um, and the language in the broader context in which it's sort of part of, so equally kind of contributing to other languages as well as you know, being shaped by the languages. So in that sense, it's all, it's really sort of a super interesting area and in that it's really quite dynamic. You can draw on different, um, you know, bits of the world, you can draw on different periods of history, and you can also speculate about what might happen in the future as well. So again, kind of, you know, not necessarily something that people always assume happens within linguistics. Um, okay, question number five, how many different languages are used throughout the world? 10, 95, 4,000, 6,000, and 11,000. So again, sort of, you know, one of the discussions that people might have is sort of, you know, what constitutes a language? How do we define languages? Where do they start? Where do they stop? So none of these questions are particularly neat or particularly um, easy. And again, sort of, you know, how, how are these things defined? And again, these would be questions that we could, um, you know, you'd be sort of discussing in some of your um, lectures uh, with different colleagues and kind of, you know, some of the things that you might be reading about is, well, how do people how do people engage with these types of questions and why? And, you know, what, what, why do we need to know how many languages there are? 
you know, if we're looking at around you know, ideas around language revitalization, um, language change, language shift, if we're looking at ideas around identity, around power, um, again, kind of having a sense of what's happening with, across um, the world in terms of different languages, languages changing, new ones coming in. Again, we, it gives us a, an idea as to you know, how people are doing things, what's changing and what influences those things. So again, sort of language in this really sort of nice broad context. Question number six. So as I mentioned before, um, a number of our colleagues work on um, African languages. And this is a question from my uh, lovely colleague, Hannah Gibson, um, who works um, in, she specializes in Swahili, but also um, other Bantu languages as well. So her question was, you know, Swahili is a language spoken in various parts of East and Central Africa, including Kenya, Tanzania, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So in this language, so in Swahili, what do you think Kipi Lefty means? Um, do we think it refers to law, a child, roundabout, or a hand? So if we were in in Tanzania and you, uh, you know, someone talked about Kipi Lefty, what would they be talking about? A, B, C, or D? Okay, question number seven. At which age does a person lose the ability to learn a new language? Is it six months? Is it two years? Is it 15 years or is it never? Again, kind of you know, depending on in at Essex in particular, we are quite unique in our department in that we have two sort of four broad areas of linguistics. So what we might call sort of descriptive or traditional linguistics. So again, looking at kind of how languages are built up. So looking at sort of, you know, the little bits of words and maybe kind of the morphology, the syntax, the phonology, so how it sounds and the different grammars. And um, so that might be one way that we might look at things. Um, we might also take a more sociolinguistic perspective. So again, looking at things to do with age, gender, um, ethnicity, location, social and economic status, um, history, um, all of these sorts of things. We might also look at it from a, uh, a psycholinguistic perspective. So again, this idea of sort of how do things work internally, so the science of your brain in many ways. Um, and then also from what we also discuss as an, an applied linguistics perspective as well. So what, we have all of this knowledge about what language does, and then what do we do with it? So people like myself, um, who would be described as an applied linguist, who work in, in to do with sort of teaching, to do with education, to do with maybe perhaps outreach around languages, to do with maybe um, working with NGOs, working with things. So how do we teach this? How do we, what do we do with all of this information once we've got it? So these sort of four areas. Um, and you could see a question like this perhaps being really interesting to you know, all of those different disciplines. Um, so you know, how, how do we monitor that? How do we do experiments on that? How do we test this? And then once we've got this information, what do we do with it in terms of how we, how we learn? So a kind of an interesting question in that, in that sense that it brings all of these aspects together. So if you were studying in a department like ours, um, these are the kinds of things that you, know, that you would have all of these different angles. Um, and so you would do kind of classes that would kind of engage you in those different perspectives. And so in that sense, that's quite exciting. And as I said, that's, they're not all linguistics departments across the country have these four together. And very few, even further, have uh, then languages as in the department as well. So in that sense, we're also really lucky that you can be studying uh, a foreign language, but also then kind of studying linguistics as well. And um, again, in the same space. So that's really a really nice thing about um, Essex for me anyway. So um, that's uh, part of the reason why well, how these questions have come about. Um, question number eight, then, how many languages are spoken in Mexico? Is it 1, 50, 100, and 200? So some of the things, you know, people might sort of, you know, what are, if you're thinking about how you answer this question, I mean, some of you might uh, be familiar with Mexico, some of you might know that, so that's great. If not, kind of what sort of information might you be using to um, have a really good guess at the answer as well? And again, those would be the kinds of things that in classes that you might be discussing. So what would it be? Do, what do we know about the geography of Mexico? What do we know about the location of Mexico? What do we know about the uh, the recent and kind of long histories of Mexico and how might those things then kind of influence the way in which we might answer a question like this? What kinds of other questions would that lead on to, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the ways in which you might be able to kind of approach these types of questions. Question number nine, the most linguistically diverse country in the world has over 850 indigenous languages. Um, again, questions around indigenous, what does that mean? Um, how do we know? But the sense that, you know, that these languages are um, local perhaps to that region or to that country, what kind of have kind of uh, started from there are, are local to that. 
Um, so this particular country has 850 languages. Uh, and which country is it? Is it Kenya? Is it Kiribati? Is it Uruguay? Or is it Papua New Guinea? And again, the same questions that we used um, to think about sort of the context of Mexico might also be the same kinds of questions we could use um, to perhaps kind of have a think about, well, what would cause, what would create, what would encourage, um, and what would maintain this many different languages in a particular context? Um, so as I said, again, um, you know, kind of linguistics and drawing on this really interesting set of broad, uh, broad knowledge as well. So often you find kind of linguists working quite often alongside other um, historians, uh, people working in government, people working in kind of other kind of policy areas, because again, kind of the things that we're interested in are really quite complementary to many other um, disciplines within social sciences as well as sort of humanities as well. And the last question then, very excitingly, ooh, ooh, um, question number 10. Uh, most people in the world speak how many languages natively. Um, so again, kind of a word, this idea of native, a word that is often used in all kinds of different ways. Um, and again, from a linguistics perspective, we can kind of challenge, problematize, question that. So what do we, what do we mean by this idea of native? Um, so, you know, if we think about it in terms of a language that you perhaps have known from birth, have used from birth or from a really young age, or, or to the point where you think actually this is really a, a language that just sort of feels very comfortable and yet you can do all kinds of different things in um, so this idea of native. Is it uh, one, two, three or four? So I'm happy to go back and have a, a recap of any of the questions. If not, we, I'll give you a, a, a moment um, and then we can uh, carry on with the answers. Right? There's been, uh, thank you to the students for all your answers because there's been quite a lot of. Um, oh, brilliant. Sorry. Quite, quite a few answers going on here in the chat and we've seen everyone uh, taking part. So thank you for that. So I'm, I'm sure they're really, you know, they're really keen to find out what the answers okay. are. Okay, let's do it. Okay. So question number one then is um, Kelly, <laughs> sorry, can it? Sorry, I had to Google that before. Uh, so I'm trying to, <laughs> my old brain trying to remember the pronunciation of this. What does it mean? Da 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 da. It means drinking by yourself um, in your house, in your garden, with no intention of going out. Um, so in many ways, Finland were ahead of the curve in terms of uh, preparing for lockdown, in terms of the kind of the language and the ways in which uh, um, they kind of are able to, to, to do these kinds of things. So there's a wonderful idea that, you know, that's it. I'm not doing anything else. I am just staying at home in my underwear. And I'm going to be, you know, having a fine old time drinking by myself. Um, so all kinds of different, as I said, all kinds of different ways in which languages do different things. So we might look at it from, a, as I said, from a grammatical perspective, but also social culturally as well. Who would say this? When is it okay to say it? You know, is it something my grand would say? Is it something my parents would say? Is it something my children would say? So again, we could start to really look and engage um, with that as well. Is it something that people in a particular geographical region would use? Um, so again, kind of all different sort of interesting um, approaches to that. Question number two, the idea of uh, what does this word mean? Cob, balm, batch, tea cake and muffin. Um, so the sense of it, it's a bread roll. Uh, so this might be something that, uh, you know, that you knew or have come across before. It's something that is quite interesting, um, you know, and this is just sort of a, you know, a version of this. Um, people may disagree about the number. Um, as I said, you know, lots of things about language because of its dynamic sort of sense is that there are lots of kinds of uh, choices, options, discussions to be had. So that makes it really exciting. So uh, on this slide, it says, you know, there are 18 terms for bread roll uh, across Britain. Um, so again, depending on where you're, uh, perhaps you might be coming from, you know, perhaps you might say some different things. But for me, one of the things I find really interesting is the <laughs> number seven uh, in Liverpool, bin lid, I think it's about fabulous like I'm not sure I ever want to actually eat anything that was called bin lid but it kind of gives you a sense of sort of you know where where might it have been cooked how might it have been stored all different kinds of sort of insights into um, pieces of history perhaps um, and sort of different ways in which we might do there's another one I think called oven bottom as well so again sort of brilliant ways in which kind of language does really great stuff um, question number three uh, Sorry. Oh, hello. Sorry, yes. Tracy, to interrupt. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, please do. Um, thank you. Um, so I don't know, maybe some of our students are thinking, oh, well, you know, I might do a languages degree at university. Mm -hmm. So when you've uh, presented this question to us, you've mentioned also to do with, you know, the pronunciation of the mm -hmm. words. 
So um, I was wondering if you could explain to us, like, uh, do you have any modules at University at Essex, for example, where you do specifically phonetics? I don't know if the students know what the phonetics are and you can perhaps explain to us what, what this yeah, is. Absolutely. So in your first year, so across the department, we do these four areas of linguistics. And so certainly um, you know, under the ideas of sort of, you know, descriptive traditional linguistics, you would you would certainly cover um, things around phonetics and phonology. So how do you how do you physically make sounds um, and how do languages do that differently? So there are different ways in which we um, can uh, show that. So the, the position in your mouth, the kind of the force that's used, there are different charts for kind of looking at that and exploring that. Um, so in your first year, if you were doing a degree in linguistics, um, or any of our degrees, you would take courses in um, phonology. So I think it's called sounds um, in the first year. And then in your, in your second year, third year, if that's an area that you were really interested in, then they then kind of takes up the ideas of phonology. Um, so yeah, you would look at that and we can would look at comparisons between English. Um, as I said, one of the interesting things about sort of uh, members of the department is that they are working on lots of Bantu languages. So those kind of click languages so that you may be familiar with in terms of sort of South Africa or different parts of Africa, those one, the languages that have the click. Um, so again, how are those sounds uh, pronounced and, and what does that tell us? And how does that change over time? Um, so again, those sorts of things would be kind of different ways. For myself, um, I work mostly on the English language um, teaching degrees. So we look at phonology in quite a different way in terms of, you know, if you're trying to teach people English, how do you teach phonology? What can you do to help learners whose languages may not have particular sounds to make those sounds and, and, and to produce those? Um, and kind of, you know, in a spectrum of kind of different types of pronunciation as well. Like how do people, how do people do that? Um, does that help? Does that make sense? Thank you. Thanks very much. I think, yeah, that's really helpful. Then also to get an idea what, what mm. sort of, that, that would be another question actually. Mm. How many kind of, um, in a general languages degree, how many linguistics related modules would you expect? I think depending, sorry, this is a terrible answer. I apologize. So depending on the degree you're doing, um, depends on how many modules you would be able to take. So if you're doing uh, predominantly languages, um, then you have you obviously quite a few of your core uh, modules will be required to be um, languages modules, but you have optional modules. Um, and I think that's possibly one or two a term maybe. Um, and so they could possibly then be uh, linguistics. Um, and also as well, sometimes people take uh, subjects from outside of our department as well. Um, also then for other, um, uh, we, for joint degrees, you would then have a bit more time as well to perhaps take up more um, linguistics modules because they would be some core degree, uh, some core modules that you'd be required to take in that kind of joint degree programs as well. So something like English, um, French and modern languages and linguistics, for example, you would do a combination. That's brilliant. Thank you very yeah. much. And yeah. Cla Claudia, my colleague who will be along after me, she would certainly be someone to ask about those as well because she would have lots of information about those. Yes, actually, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in a few minutes we'll be yeah. here. Thank yeah. you very much. Sorry no to problem. Carry no, no problem. Okay. 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 Just for the time, so thank you, thank you. No, that's fine. Um, so in terms of sign languages then, I'll just quickly rattle through these, but if you've got any questions, again, just shout out. 200 um, sign languages used in the world. And so what is kind of interesting, again, is how different languages do this. So again, so we look at the differences between American Sign Language and British Sign Language. You know, they may, you know, they're talking about English, perhaps, um, but, you know, doing it very differently with American Sign Language as being more influenced or American Sign Language being influenced by um, French more than English. So again, you know, kind of things that you might be able to look at or explore if you were kind of interested in those things as well. Number four, I asked you about which, you know, how much was borrowed from where, and this is uh, French, sort of 30%. And again, sort of historically, if we think about the Norman Conquest, if we think about our historical relationships with France, that sort of makes sense in many ways. But again, there's different ways that we could, uh, different languages that we would look at. Um, numbers of languages used throughout the world, 6,000. So there's all different types of ways that we might be concerned about this, interested in this, studying this, that we look about ideas around language endangerment, language preservation, language restoration. So there's lots of colleagues in the department who would be looking at those kinds of things. A nice question about Swahili, um, Keepy Lefty is wonderfully uh, a roundabout. If you think about the direction that you travel round a roundabout and this idea of keep left. Um, again, and if we're talking about sort of pronunciation and different types of inflection, the ways in which um, Swahili might um, kind of then uh, change that. So a wonderful kind of example there of languages merging and developing. Uh, what an age does a language use the, lose? Uh, sorry, what age does a person lose the ability to learn language? Uh, mercifully, never. 
So we see lots of kind of things in the press, uh, well, I say press, but in some papers about, um, you know, it's impossible, you know, you're not too old to learn, too old to learn. And this is, you know, in, in, in the politer sense, all a, a complete nonsense. Um, you know, you, we can learn and keep learning languages at any age. So if you haven't learned languages yet, and you're interested, then do carry on. It's wonderful because you're just never too old to become fluent. So we know that motivation plays a huge part in this. We know that, you know, where you are, what you're trying to do. Um, and again, sort of, you know, different ways in which people become multilingual. And this is a nice article by our head of department um, in the conversation. So that's something you can have a look at if that's uh, an area that you're interested in. Quickly then, Mexico, wonderfully, 200 languages. So again, if we think about the history, if we think about the range of different indigenous peoples that are um, in and across Mexico, this sort of makes lots of sense there. Um, question number nine, in linguistically diverse countries, um, it is Papua New Guinea, again, for really similar reasons to Mexico in a way, if we think about where Papua New Guinea is. Um, so, you know, it's really, uh, an island nation, lots of kind of interesting geography um, and lots of different types of peoples there, kind of, you know, perhaps able to move about, perhaps not. Languages in contact, languages kind of in isolation. So again, all kinds of different ways that we might you know, engage with these kinds of things in and around um, language use, language spread, languages in the world. And then finally, then question number 10, how many languages? Two. I mean, typically people are sort of at least bilingual, <clears throat> if not, you know, uh, largely multilingual. So that, again, these are kind of areas that, um, you know, in terms of myths, in terms of challenges, in terms of people, things that people might be interested in. Um, these might be kind of areas, <laughs> excuse me, that you could certainly take up and, and look at if you were doing um, this type of degree. Um, so there's a link here to our departmental pages. Um, I'm at the moment the Director of Undergraduate uh, Admissions for Linguistics. So if you have any questions, then please, please, please send me an email. And, you know, you can have questions that are about Essex or about anything, really, just generally kind of linguistics or applications to university. Please don't hesitate if you've got any questions to email me. So it's T costly, basically. And then everyone else's email will also be the same at essex.ac.uk. So if there's anything you would like to know um, that we haven't had a chance to look at today, then do feel free to get in touch. Um, I don't know if there's a, a minute or two for any questions, possibly not, but if... Um, Thank if, you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank no you very, very yeah. much. I see Dela typing something. Yeah. Uh, guys, we don't really have much long because we need to go to another talk. I need to be in another talk in a minute. But um, thank you very much, Tracy. Can I ask you a very quick one? Yeah. Uh, um, sure. Since I don't, I don't think anyone has posted any here. Um, is it true that once we learn a language, we're more able to learn more languages? And how can we train ourselves to be able to learn more? Because I've been I've been trying to learn Arabic and, and it's been really hard, even though I, I speak Italian, French, English and Spanish. Yeah, I, I am really struggling with Arabic. So why is that the case? And how can we sort of train ourselves to yeah. our brains to yeah. to improve? Yeah. I think if you've got all, a number of different linguists in the room, they would all give you two different kinds of answers. So my best answer would be that I think possibly to do with sort of, you know, motivation and exposure, the tip for me anyway, would be kind of crucial ways in which you can uh, engage and learn a language. So, you know, if you're really motivated, whether that's for, you know, personal reasons, whether that's most of them, the most successful linguists I know have been motivated by, you know, they, they want to talk to their friends, their partners, their girlfriends, boyfriends, etc., or their jobs, they want to travel. So those things, so there's a really strong motivation um, that that carries you more than perhaps any kind of cognitive um, abilities, perhaps. And again, this is my sort of uh, the area that I'm in. Um, but then also as well, kind of exposure. So, you know, if you're trying to learn, but you're only sort of, you know, able to do it sort of for an hour a day, or if not, you know, 10 minutes a day, then that's going to change, you know, to if you were kind of you know, living in an Arabic speaking environment, that would also kind of increase your opportunities. So things around, you know, getting into practices of listening to Arabic TV, radio, watching, you know, or reading news, engaging with that, and kind of, you know, trying to kind of get immersed in that as much as possible. I think for me, with the strategies. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you uh, to both of you for being here with us. Thank you for your time. That's We've wonderful. really enjoyed the talk. Um, right. For the students, um, I don't know if you've seen the chat, but um, we've got there a link. If you want to get in touch with Essex University, please, or have any questions or anything, please use the, the link that has been provided there in, in the chat. And, and thank you so much. Thanks again to all of you for being here this morning. And if you're joining us next, then I'll see you in the next talk. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank bye, you. Bye. 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 Bye.